Imagine seeing the months of the year as a circle around you, or visualizing numbers and dates in physical space. Welcome to my world. Hi, my name is John Small, and this is an introduction to my story of being on the autism spectrum and having spatial sequence synesthesia. My whole life I've been on the autism spectrum, and it wasn't until a few years ago I started realizing that, and I always imagined numbers, sequences, uh, relationships of cyclical things like seasons, and uh, especially the months, in patterns in my mind. And that's actually known as spatial sequence synesthesia. And I didn't understand or know I had that until just a few months ago. I assumed everyone saw numbers and, and dates and history and timelines and paths and circles in their mind. In daily life, I don't think there's a large impact, at least not that I'm aware of, with spatial sequence synesthesia. That's seeing the numbers and dates and timelines. Thus, I'm referring to something based on something historical, something in my past, something in the history of uh, a topic I'm discussing, or the ancestry I'm working on. I see things in different areas in my mind. So what I... What I do when I speak, and some of that might come off on my videos, is as I'm speaking, and I don't know if this is an autistic thing or just a, a unique quirk that I have, uh, I, I'm looking inward, basically. So I'm replaying um, almost a movie, uh, a storyline or an image, and I'm recalling that. So sometimes people with autism can get very hyper-focused on a subject, and they will reiterate every nuance, sometimes chronologically. That's what I'm doing. Uh, sometimes I don't cut to the chase in a story because I'm replaying the, the movie in my mind. So imagine you're going to explain a movie that you've seen to somebody and they want to know the details. You might give an overview, but in my mind, I'm basically playing that memory or movie, speaking as to you as I'm also viewing it inside. So that's the type of patterns and chaos that <laughs> that work internally. Um, so to go back to the spatial sequence synesthesia, I don't think that affects daily life. It's more of the high functioning autism, the way I view and visualize and process things. The the connections that we have uh, in autism or, or synesthesia um, are a different, a different type of wiring than how neurotypicals are wired, how the majority of the population interacts, views um, circumstances and sequences in their lives, and then relay that to other people. So we process a little bit differently. It can more easily get us bogged down, I think, because we're looking at such fine details that it's the focus sometimes is hard to to maintain a track because there's a lot of things firing off at one time. So while we're trying to describe this event or movie that we're seeing in our mind about an event that took place or part of history, um, there's also a lot of other things happening. So if the phone is ringing, a dog is barking, people are talking, my mind wants to tune into each one of those and it's hard for me to keep focused. And um, that's why even like putting a video together, I need to have some kind of an outline or tracking because I can go off and speak as I am now on a tangent and end up in a whole other place before I loop back around and get to the point I was trying to make. Uh, that's some of the difficulties that people with autism may have if they're either on a different part of the spectrum and not communicative uh, verbally, maybe, um, or if they are. Uh, we have to learn to harness the the essence of what we're trying to say. And that can be a little bit tricky in some conversations. And I think it can happen, too, if we're talking to an individual. If I'm talking with an individual, I'll notice neurotypicals interact differently. And I can't fully mimic that. Um, distractions and, and um, hyper-focus play a part in it. Just the inner workings. So it's it's interesting in my perspective to see other people interact and to try to learn and process that. But even though I can mask some of the natural inclinations I might have in speaking, 
uh, there's a part of it always underlying and you can become very articulate but that doesn't mean that the basis of your neural pathways and neural connections that are a little bit different and cannot change you can't rewire those connections differently uh, there's always an underlying part of that so it's a it's a combination of practice and then also accepting um, how you're built, how you're designed, how your mind works. So spatial sequence synesthesia may not apparently affect my day-to-day -day life and create challenges. It, it's more of a useful tool for thinking things in advance, placing dates and images in my mind. The autism is a little bit different because I like to anticipate things that are going to happen and I can't foresee everything that will happen my mind basically creates multiple scenarios of what likely could happen and in each scenario how I could react to it based on where I'm going, what the circumstance of events will be, where I'm heading to, like an event or uh, just meeting friends. So I'm visualizing where we're going to meet, how it's going to look, where we even might sit, who I might be facing, different possibilities of conversations that could come up. So I'm somewhat prepared. I feel like uh, there's like, for me, the way I process things like the deer in the headlights, and it would be more easy for me to be just kind of stumble um, on things and try to, you know, like, oh, I need to sit back and think about this for a minute. So in preparation, my mind plays that out. The challenge is life doesn't happen as we plan, even on a day-to-day -day basis. So the plan of where we're going to meet a couple of friends might change to say, hey, that place was closed, but let's meet in a different place. And that's not a big shift for me, but I do sort of have to reimagine everything. Whereas people without the autism, I think they just, they more easily flow with it. It just, they're, okay, that's where we're going to meet today and great. But in my mind, it's like, oh, different setting. Where's the sun going to be? Like, in, are we going to be facing a window and what you know, what time is it? What will the scenery be? So I won't be so distracted by things when we get in. It's that kind of day-to-day. -day. That's just a little example of like if I'm meeting friends, but if something happens in the course of a work day or something that was scheduled or the car breaks down, to me it's that deer in the headlight again, like now what do I do? Who do I call? Do I have a triple A card? Do I have to tell someone? To me, I stumble more on that stuff because it's not planned out. If I know what I need to do and I stay on a timeline, it's it's there's a rigidity to that. That repetitive or sameness or predictability uh, makes for things very timely. So if I need to be, you know, an assignment for an illustration or there's some work related or even a social thing, that all plays out in my mind and. The autism and spatial sequence synesthesia probably work together to help me keep track of everything. Um, bills don't get unpaid because I track everything. They're all based on a timeline and a, a system of repetition, even though it's cyclical, probably. Um, that all gets locked in. It's, it's those unexpected occurrences that happen every day and that's what some of my challenges might be to stumble through so there's those you know the downsides of challenges i guess with having autism the upsides are uh, attention to detail and focus and studying something <laughs> to an extent that can drive people crazy if i get on a roll with like something i've been working on say it's a part of ancestry and i will want to keep talking about that and we'll probably say it out over and over again in different conversations. So if someone was in previous conversations, they'll hear it almost as if I'm reading something because I'll give the same dates and the same sequence of events and the same highlights. And that can help in historic contexts and doing ancestry research. It also helps in my artwork where I'm doing more detailed work, more more focused, I guess, work, you know, I like... I've seen some artists that do just brilliant stuff, just quick strokes with a brush or a pencil, and they get the flow and the movement, and it's not, everything's not perfect. Everything's not in a place of, like, just where you're not, your eyes aren't fooled into thinking it's a photograph. And I work, attempt to work, to where I'm 
almost mimicking what our eyes see with a photograph or in real life. And it doesn't always get there. That's not always the goal. But if I'm doing a pet portrait for someone or drawing a lighthouse like the one in the back, um, background of me, it's the details I put in to try to capture what is being seen. There's another side of that where you can add a whimsical element, which I do, and I create anthropomorphic mice or polar bears. Anthropomorphic being, they look like the animal, but they kind of have human-like characteristics and quirks and wearing scarves and jackets and stuff, and they don't necessarily look real. And it's that kind of blend of cartoon fantasy illustration with, you know, I try to add details of realism into it. Having autism, I think, helps me focus on work in those details. So if I'm doing a pet portrait and I'm working on fine details of, you know, fur and the subtle, you know, unique aspects of the animal's eyes and the different color combinations and coordination of many hues that you might see as a dog's brown eyes, but it might have five or, or more different colors mixed in that I'm seeing and I'm trying to recreate that or bring that to life more so than maybe a photograph did. That's those are helpful to me. Doing research for ancestry is helpful to me. Working towards minimalism and decluttering, which you can see it's like stuff in the background, it's a work in progress. And just as a side note, we moved here last year and um, we went from not a huge place, but we went from a larger space into a much smaller space. So what I have now in this room with my art supplies and ancestry photographs and musical instruments, used to be in a space maybe four times the size of this, like in a basement. That had to consolidate. So even though I, I made really good progress on decluttering, you put yourself in a much smaller space and that little bit that you pare down to ends up looking like a lot more in a smaller space. So it's a combination of um, adjusting to your space and continuing to decrease what you have. That's still what I'm in the process of doing and I've continued to pare down more and more possessions. So yes, if you could leave a comment, like this video if it was helpful, uh, share your experiences or thoughts on, on this topic, and also if you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I've got quite a bit of content on here and I'm going to be making a lot more videos and some specifically on this subject. And if you hit the notifications bell, that will alert you when I put out a new video. It should alert you. I don't know if the uh, YouTube system works fully in that, but it'll help you to keep track of um, what I might be posting. And of course, I'll post this on my social media for the links and everything. But I hope you enjoyed it. I look forward to talking more about this and really engaging with each of you about your experiences and your thoughts on this. So until next time, have a great day.